Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, Watergate figure John Dean will join us in studio to discuss Watergate's lasting impact on American government and politics. John Dean, next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Former State Senate President Russell Pierce could be violating Maricopa County's email policy by sending messages regarding illegal immigration enforcement from his county treasurer's email account. The Arizona Republic reports that Pierce appears to be violating the county's ban on using email for, among other things, inappropriate, political, or personal gain purposes. Pierce works for County Treasurer Charles Hoskins overseeing an elderly assistance program. No comment as yet from Pierce or from Hoskins. John Dean served as White House counsel for President Richard Nixon and was a major player in the Watergate scandal, from events leading to the 1972 break-ins at the Democratic National Committee to the subsequent cover-up and, eventually, as a key witness for Watergate prosecutors. Dean pleaded guilty to one felony count of obstruction of justice in exchange for his testimony and spent four months in custody of the Witness Protection Program. Dean eventually became an investment banker, an author of many books, and a lecturer. Joining us now is John Dean. Welcome to Arizona Horizon. Good to have you here. Thank you, Ted. Uh, so you much. Know, I was thinking as you were reading that, my mother used to have Arizona Horizons, the, the magazine. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I haven't thought about that in years. Yeah, it, well, I think it's Arizona Highways. It was Arizona Highways. Yeah, but right. yeah, it's, it, it's close enough. And a lot of folks, that's the only thing they knew of us was and Arizona Highways. She's living Highway. in Ohio. Uh, that's following that's where the biggest crowd was. <laughs> hey, um, there's so much to talk to you about, but just let's take a, a 30,000 foot view here. How do you see your role in U.S. history? Well, good question. It depends on who's writing the history, <laughs> as Nixon famously said. Um, I've never been concerned about the truth coming out. In fact, I did a book recently on the tapes, what's on the tapes. Uh, and I, I titled the book, The Nixon Defense, What He Knew and When He Knew It. The New York, one of the New York Times reviewers said, this really should have been the Dean defense. I didn't know that when I started in here. Uh, to look at the tapes. Uh, no one had transcribed all of his Watergate conversations. And I come out very well. Uh, they realize, you know, that I'm trying to end the cover-up. I'm trying to convince my colleagues to come forward and do the right thing. Uh, I'm trying to get the president to do the right thing. Uh, I couldn't have asked for it better. Uh, and I, I always suspected that would be in there. And I wasn't able to testify in that kind of detail because I just didn't remember that kind of detail. Watergate is such a, a behemoth in terms of American history. Um, your role in U.S. history could change. It's changed before. It could continue to change, couldn't it? Uh, I, well, I don't know that it would change. Uh, it, 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 uh, what I was was sort of the guy who broke rank, uh, let my colleagues know I was going to do it. I had had it with the cover-up and forced the issue. Uh, I, I, I read recently uh, some material that Nixon had written in his memoir about my testimony where he said they, in essence, knew they were dead after I mm -hmm. testified. And it wasn't so much my Watergate testimony where they thought they had some defenses. It was because I explained the atmosphere in which this happened. And he said we never could recover from that. Indeed, you're, uh, when, when you kind of broke the idea that there was taping going on, that was huge. That was a bombshell. And it's you know, subsequently well, we learned. It, 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 when I broke the news, everybody ignored it. Yeah. What happened is it, it provoked eventually the, the Senate Watergate Committee staff to follow up, and it was actually the member of the staff who was trying to discredit my testimony saying to Alex Butterfield when yes. they called him in, Mr. Butterfield, Dean made this statement he thought he was taped. Now that's silly, isn't it? And Butterfield said, well, he didn't know. Yeah. And they, the rest was history, the, of course. And those tapes, they, the ta if there was a smoking gun, it was those tapes, wasn't it? It, w it was clearly. The, uh, it, it, it just resolved who was telling the truth. Was it, was it me or was it the tapes? And uh, I didn't know that it, it was a system-wide. I just knew because of his behavior in one of our conversations, happened to be on April 15th, where at one point in the conversation, after a bunch of leading questions, uh, which was unusual in our conversations. He gets up, goes to the corner of the office in a stage whisper. He says, I was foolish to talk to Chuck Colson, another aide, about clemency for Howard Hunt, one of the Watergate burglars. 
And I said, yes, Mr. President, that was probably an obstruction. At that moment, it clicked in my head. He's recording this. And I, of course, would report that. I actually put it in my testimony at the very last moment because it was something I really wasn't positive of. Uh, but I also was bootstrapping. Yeah. I, I thought if people, th I thought I might be, you know, not only that, but other conversations recorded. I was, I was trying to do something to say, well, if I think I'm recorded, I, and I did, uh, I'm not going to lie about those conversations. You mentioned your new book, you, you uh, go through a lot of these tapes, correct? And you, did you transcribe these personally, all of them? Some of them. What happened is, um, my editor asked me, do I have any questions about Watergate? And I said, yeah, I have a couple. One big one is how could anybody as savvy as Richard Nixon let a bungled burglary destroy his presidency? I, I said, I, I was not in the office all the time. I only have like 30 conversations very late with Nixon. And I said, the answer's on the tapes. I think most of them have probably been transcribed. Well, that was not correct. Nobody had even cataloged them all. I found a thousand conversations. I found 600 conversations. I don't think anybody outside the archives had ever listened to. And I didn't find a tape in the process that didn't give me revelation. I started the process, realized this is overwhelming. I can't do it alone. I was lucky. I asked a friend of mine who teaches an, an archival science course in Southern California if he had anybody he thought might be a good transcriber. He said, yeah, I do. Uh, and the woman he selected, was a godsend. She uh, was a former legal secretary. She was a little older than the other students and kind of became the, the team captain, if you will. Uh, and she did 500 of a thousand conversations. My goodness. And she was good. You said uh, there were revelations along the way. What surprised you most? What, uh, I mean, what, we'll keep that question. I got a follow up in a second. Okay. But what surprised you most? <laughs> well, I, the, the one that really kind of I said, I can't believe what I'm listening to, is when he and Holloman get into my sex life. <laughs> Holy smokes. <laughs> they know I'm married to an, a very attractive lady, uh, both then and now, and <laughs> those tapes just blew me away, and I, 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 I put them in the book. I couldn't exclude them because I, I was trying to let the tapes tell the story. Uh, so the book has sex, yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a modern, modern book there. Back to, back to Richard Nixon and your dealings with him. I mean, he is such an enigma. I mean, he continues to be, he will always be that, that, that walking question mark. Um, did he ever fully understand why he had to leave office? Did he ever, did he get yeah, it? he did get it. Uh, in fact, I just read uh, and reviewed for this Friday uh, a book by Alex, or actually by Bob Woodward on Alex Butterfield, the man who revealed the taping system, yes. who was instructed to install it, and, and then later when the Senate asked him, told the truth that there was a taping system. Uh, Alex, I, those of us who knew Alex well, knew Alex had a thousand Nixon stories. Before the taping system was put in, in February of 71, Nixon starting on January 20 of 69, uh, Butterfield is kind of the human tape recorder mm -hmm. for that era. Had n had no had the most contact of anybody in the White House with Nixon, and has a, has a remarkable he's 89. Still has a great memory. So Bob found this source and found some dynamite material. He also kept 20 boxes of files uh, of documents that did not get into the system. Some really incriminating material on Nixon on Vietnam in particular. So anyway, we keep learning more about Nixon, and, and uh, uh, the answer is, uh, uh, you know, he is a very complex character. He is a very shy man for a politician. He's very awkward with people he doesn't know. Uh, Butterfield tells wonderful stories about getting, it takes weeks for Haldeman to introduce him into the new job he'll take because Nixon has to get to know people. I didn't start dealing with Nixon for years after I'm there. And then when he discovers me, he has another thing that surprised me, all the nice things he had to say on the tapes about me. But anyway, he, he is a, you know, Haldeman at one point gave an interview to Mike Wallace on 60 Minutes. Uh, and Wallace later wrote about this. And, 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 and sort of an aside, not on camera, Mike Wallace asked Nixon, or asked uh, Haldeman, what is Nixon really like? Yes. And Haldeman said, he's the weirdest man I ever met. <laughs> and that, Butterfield, in essence, says the same. Yeah, it, it's I didn't have as many dealings as they did. Uh, you know, Haldeman said, for example, the only time I ever shook hands with Nixon was the day he fired me. 
and forced me to resign. Uh, he didn't even know how many children I had uh, for all the years I worked with him. So th this is a very unusual character. The, uh, you mentioned Bob Woodward and his new book. Your thoughts on how the media investigated Watergate? Well, I'm talking about that tonight in a very abbreviated form because it's not a long form. Uh, in fact, I'm doing a course here at ASU in the spring where we're going to do some deep diving into this subject. Uh, I've been gathering material for 40 years and have a remarkable archive, and I thought time to share that with students. And being appointed to the Goldwater Chair for American Institutions here, it's just the perfect opportunity to, uh, to share that m kind of material. So uh, your question again to the, be... The, just uh, in general, how the media covered how Watergate. How the media... Woodward and Bernstein obviously are the, a major Well, they are, they are the first part of the story. Wood, the Washington Post, Ben Bradley, actually uh, 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 Len Downey, who's here at the school, could tell us uh, more about how the Post mm -hmm. took this story on. Uh, his editor, Barry Sussman, who I've gotten to know over the years, just said, we just, we smelled it. We just knew uh, that this couldn't be a bunch of low-level people. I mean, how many, how, who other than the Republicans would be breaking in and trying to bug the Democrats other than the Republicans? And who other than Richard Nixon would be somehow responsible for the Republicans? Reaction to Woodward and Bernstein, the reporting in the Post, reaction to the media coverage from inside the White House. They never wrote a story that troubled us. And I've told, I have told Bob that there, there are stories that Ziegler went out, uh, the press secretary, and made all kinds of noise about just to in, try to intimidate them because Nixon was most annoyed at the way they stayed on the story. Where the Post had their big impact uh, is not so much that they broke new information because we knew everything they were writing. Uh, we learned it from the investigators before they did, but they were just reporting inside the Beltway and their Im greatest impact is on people in the, in the Beltway, the Congress, uh, the people in the courthouse, in the Justice Department, the judges, the senators. These are the people who are reading Woodward and Bernstein and they're the ones who say this investigation isn't going to go away. So that's the big impact they have. But as, and I know that uh, quote unquote associates of Dean were credited as, as being sources for Woodward and Bernstein. Very late, after I break rank. Okay, not so before that. not before that. No, I, 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 I never had a contact with Bob uh, or Carl until long after the fact, and, and my, one of my attorneys who told me literally decades after the fact what he had done, he kept me very honest when I went before the Senate or anybody else said, I've never, I, any report or rapport I've had with any reporter mm -hmm. has always been on the record, and that was true. As far as confidential sources, did inside the White House, did they seem to understand where some of this stuff was coming? Did they have ideas where it was coming we, from? We knew that Mark Felt, who became Deep Throat for the Washington Post, the, uh, the great anonymous source uh, that fed Woodward, uh, we knew who he was. We didn't know, we didn't connect him up with the Deep Throat character because the Deep Throat character doesn't appear until February of 76, 74, mm -hmm. excuse me, when they write and publish All the President's Men, and that's where that character is. Uh, but before that, we did know that Felt was leaking. In fact, I go over to the Justice Department one day, and the head of the criminal division, who had been in the FBI with Felt, didn't, not, was not a, fa a Felt fan, <laughs> called him, he said, we call him the white rat because he talks to the press so much. And so uh, he was prematurely gray-haired. But anyway, uh, Henry Peterson tells me that a general counsel of a, one of the major news organizations has come in here, they're very concerned that Felt is giving them grand jury information. They don't want to get involved in an obstruction of justice, but he is leaking like a sieve. I take that back to Haldeman. Haldeman takes it into the president. Uh, later, uh, John Mitchell will get confirmation from that same general counsel through another source. And so, yes, we, we absolutely knew Felt was leaking. Did you know that most, I guess you would have to know then, a lot of his information, I know that Leonard Downey says the Post never, never uh, published inaccurate information uh, coming from Felt, but it sounds like- He says like they never published inaccurate- I believe he says that they did not, uh, pu nothing inaccurate from Deep Throat ever appeared in the Washington Post. Do you, do you Well, take it might be that? accurate in the fact that that's what Felt said. The, the question, I have some very deep reservations as to what Felt said accurately. In fact, I 
Bob and I have agreed to disagree on felt uh, because I have him, about half of his information is being wrong. And, just, Bob, and Bob just, Woodford says no. That it, he, he, he and I have debated it back and forth and, and what have you. And he said, John, why don't we just agree to disagree on this? Uh, and I said, Bob, I can show you in the record where this where Felt's point here is just dead wrong. I just ran into another one, somebody who had been one of Mar Bob Mardian's lawyers, who is a, a former aide to John Mitchell, who was the head of the campaign committee, uh, is thinking of, of, of doing something, uh, writing some more about this. He was a very young lawyer in the firm that defended Mardian. Martian's a, a Phoenix person, so this might be a local interest. Anyway, uh, he, he quotes, he said, I just went down and looked at Bob and Carl's notes at the Ransom Center where they have donated or, mm -hmm. or, or arranged to have their, their papers. And he said, I read what, what Mark Felt said about Bob Martian, that he was running a, a wiretapping ring, and he, he listed a whole thing, and I said, I said, those are just dead wrong. You can prove those are wrong. And it sounds like the Post, Leonard Downey and others from the Post are saying they knew they were dead and they didn't necessarily publish some of the dead. It sounds like Mark Felt was just, it sounds like he was just talking to talk half the time. I think he was late in the game when he knows he's on his way out. It, one of the biggest conversations that Woodward has with him is right after he's been fired by the acting director, Bill Ruckelshaus, and then he just kind of unloads in that conversation. Um, as far as your concern, and I want to stick with the media for a little bit here, White House plants in attacking the story, eventually in attacking you. What were you aware of? Well, I, when I broke rank, and you know, I was very open with my colleagues about what I was going to do and when I was going to do it and how I was going to do it. I, it's all on the tapes. Uh, and they don't take very kindly to it. And there are literally maybe 50 conversations where they just go in this huge circle. And they, they just keep Nixon, Haldeman, and Ehrlichman in these conversations. They were very hard to write in the book I wrote, where I didn't want to bore a reader with each one of them, but rather see what in that conversation moved the story forward. And they always come back to the same point, is let's make Dean the scapegoat. And so I'm not communicating with him at that point. So I, the one time I did talk to the press when I was in the White House, I had my secretary call a note, call the, the Post and a few other papers and say, I'm refusing to be a scapegoat. I sent that message directly to them. Um, after I break rank, I learned very quickly that they are, they have a full media press on trying to discredit me. I mean, it was standard White House attack. I mean, they, they have, they have uh, Joe Alsop calling me an underdwelling slug. Uh, and just all, I, I go from being literally Nixon's favorite guy on this, new guy on the staff he's discovered, to his number one enemy because I've refused to lie. Names, uh, William Sapphire, Jack Anderson, uh, Daniel Shore, very respected journalist. Shore has apologized to me before he died. Uh, so, so these folks did. Ander Anderson would just take anything, and, and I know exactly where these were coming from. They were all coming from, from Ehrlichman, was the principal, and somewhat from Colson, uh, two other aides. But I, I, and over the years, I've learned exactly where this stuff was coming from, and they hammered me. And they, that, as a result of that, Ted, it, it gets so serious that at one point, the, first of all, the, the uh, general counsel of the Senate Watergate Committee, Sam Dash, comes to me and says, we can't do this, but we have talked to Archibald Cox, the newly appointed Watergate special prosecutor, and we believe you should be in the witness protection program, given the level of the threats. These aren't just crazies writing in. This is pretty serious stuff. Uh, so I agreed to go into the witness protection program uh, as you said in the introduction, I was, uh, I was in the custody uh, of them for four months. I was actually in and out of the program for a year and a half uh, before my testimony. Then when it became time uh, to, to become incarcerated, rather than send me to jail, uh, I'm put at a safe house in Maryland and driven to Washington virtually every day to meet with the prosecutors. So technically you never served time in prison. No, never did. The safe house was, and you got credit for time served that way. 
Well, after four months, uh, they put me in. Obviously, the judge and the prosecutors thought I would be a stronger witness if I was actually somehow incarcerated. At the time, uh, I testified as a witness against Hall, the, the chief of staff, Bob Haldeman, the former attorney general, John Mitchell, John Ehrlichman, the former top domestic advisors, the guys who were really mm -hmm. I had worked for and had carried out their instructions. Uh, he thought I, they, I'd be a better witness in those circumstances. So at the end of, after the trial ended, uh, the judge makes a decision. He says, I'm letting him go on time served, which was 127 days. And I, at that point, uh, talked to Mo and I said, listen, we can't stay in this witness protection program. I'm not going to some little town with a picket fence and change my name. Uh, so uh, <laughs> we ended it at that point. So we've, just for those who may not have been of age at that time or have forgotten the, the depth of all this, you've got all this activity going on in and around the White House. You've got the media, some very important names there with Jack Anderson, Sapphire, and, and Daniel Shore, uh, perhaps using stories planted from the White House. You've got the White House, no doubt, uh, with critics planting stories in other areas. I don't know where the New York Times was in all this, but the Washington Post was all over the story. The New York Times never, to me, seemed to understand the story. I don't think they institutionally understand it today. They have published some harebrained stuff over the years, in the, and, and it just stuff that you would never see in the Washington Post uh, because they institutionally understand it. Uh, ben Bradley? Is that ben Bradley. Is he, was he the reason the Post had such a... Ben Bradley, uh, Bob and Carl, uh, the entire Len Downey, the, you know, the entire uh, editorial staff instood, understood the story. Uh, the, uh, Catherine Graham understood it. Her son understood it. Uh, so it, it, it just has that, and they had some great editors there in that era too. At the time, did you understand the gravity of what was going on? Eventually, obviously, you did. But when you're in the heat of the moment, did you really understand the seriousness of what was going on? I knew I was in a very difficult fight with the President of the United States because it was my word against the President. He was corroborated by his chief of staff, uh, Bob Haldeman. He was corroborated by John Ehrlichman, by the attorney general, by Chuck Colson. And it was my word against everybody else. Had the tapes not come out, I might have had uh, 500 years of perjury. But that's, that's the personal response, and that's the, the protective response. Right. Could you, could you see a constitutional crisis on the horizon from all, from a, I mean, we're talking about a burglary was, at an office complex. Yeah, I, I was, I, you know, what, what, I, what I did in my testimony is I broadened it way to show that it wasn't just an aberration, that the break-in was not just accidental. There had, in fact, we now know there are tapes with Nixon literally pounding on his desk demanding a, a, a break-in in the Brookings Institute, a think tank in Washington, which I, at the time, not knowing about it, hear about it, jump on a plane and fly to San Clemente and get it killed. <clears throat> Something that, uh, you know, it's clearly on the tapes, but, you know, they don't like to give me credit for. Uh, you mentioned getting, give me, don't like to give you credit. You do have your critics. Yes. And they, they abound and they seem to abide as well. Well, I can't, what I, it just baffles me, these guys who are making league with certified perjurers. I mean, people who've been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, they say everything they said was true, notwithstanding their convictions, and everything I said was false, and it's, it's still ongoing. And, uh, indeed, and you have these critics, that you can't believe what John Dean says. Right. When you hear people say that, how do you respond? I say, read the, listen to the tapes, look at the evidence, and why in the world would I want to falsify this? Some of these phenomenal conspiracy theories they, they come up with, I say, if I went out and said I did that, I would be, I would be you know, I would make a million dollars first, but then people would say, this guy is a colossal liar. And, and it, I could never do it because it didn't happen. Uh, but they, they keep coming up with all these new theories of what I did and how I was literally running the government at one point. Uh, here is a middle level staff man who had no access to the president at all. Uh, before we let you go, it's been a great conversation, but before we let you, you go, I just have a, just a simple question. What was on the 18 and a half minute gap of tape? What was being said there? It is a wonderful media mystery. I thought it was so important, I did a full appendix on it in the new book. 
uh, where I explain, first of all, that Rose Woods could not have done what she thought she did and make the erasure. Mechanically impossible. Yes. And then I get in. It's not as important as to what was there, but because there was nothing said there that wasn't said a hundred times in, in those conversations. You, is it your impression that she just happened to erase those 18 and a half minutes? She couldn't minutes? Have. Or, It's or, mechanically impossible for her to do it. She's totally mistaken. It was erased before she got to well, it. Well, then it must have been pretty doggone important. It, it, it was because of the timing, which I explain in the appendix. It's when, it, when this issue I arises see. Okay. So. And, and it destroys his earlier defense. So it wouldn't be revelatory necessarily now as opposed to no, then? not at all. Uh, John Dean, it's been a pleasure. It's good to have you here. Thank Thanks you, for Ted. joining us. Thank you. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.